Continuing where I have to off, chapter 10. At Brune, Prince Andre stayed with his friend Bilibin, a Russian diplomat. Ah, my dear prince, there could not be a more welcome guest, said Bilibin, coming to meet Prince Andre. Franz, take the princess things to my bedroom, he said to the servant, who was ushering Bokalsky in. So you are the harbinger of victory? Splendid! And I'm sitting here ill, as you see. When he had washed and dressed, Prince Andre went to the diplomat's luxury study and sat down to the dinner that had been prepared for him. Bilibin settled down comfortably near the fire. After his journey, to say nothing of the campaign during which he had been deprived of the comforts of cleanliness and the refinements of life, of life Prince Andre felt a pleasant sense of repose in luxurious surroundings, such as he had been accustomed to since childhood. Besides, after his reception by the Austrians, he was glad to speak, if not in Russian, they were speaking French, at least with a Russian who would, he presumed, share the general Russian apathy, so keenly felt at the time to the Austrians. Billy Bin was a man of thirty-five, a bachelor and of the same circle as Prince Andre. They had known each other in Petersburg, but had become more intimate when Prince Andre was in Vienna with Kutuzov just as Prince Andre was a young man who gave promise of going far in the military profession, so Bilibin, and to an even greater extent, promised to go far in diplomacy. He was still a young man, but no longer a young diplomat, as he had entered the service at the age of sixteen, had been in Paris and Copenhagen, and now held a post of considerable importance in Vienna. Both the Chancellor and our ambassador in Vienna knew him and valued, valued him. He was not one of those innumerable members of the diplomatic corps whose qualifications are merely negative, and who need only to speak French and to avoid doing certain things to be considered good diplomats. He was one of those who liked work and knew how to work, and despite a natural indolence, sometimes spent whole nights at his desk. He worked equally well, whatever the nature of the work. It was not the question, why, but the question, how, that interested him. It made no difference to him what the diplomatic matter might be. He took great pleasure in preparing a circular, a memorandum, or report, expertly, incisively, elegantly. Apart from what he wrote, his services were valued for his skill in conversing and dealing with those in the highest spheres. Philibin enjoyed conversation as he did work, only when it could be exquisitely witty. In society, he was continually watching for an opportunity to say something remarkable, and took part in the conversation only when he found this possible. His conversation was always sprinkled with original, witty, polished phrases of general interest. These locutions, prepared in his inner laboratory, were of a transmissible nature, as if designed to be easily remembered and carried from drawing room to drawing room by insignificant society people. And indeed, Billy Bin's mots circulating through the salons of Vienna often had influence on so-called important matters. His thin, worn, sallow face was covered with deep wrinkles that always looked as immaculate and thoroughly washed at the tips of one's fingers after a bath. The movement of these wrinkles constituted the principal play of expression on his face. At one moment, his eyebrows were raised and his forehead deeply furrowed. Then his eyebrows lowered and deep lines 
creased his cheeks. His small, deep-set eyes had a candid, merry look. Well now, tell us about your exploit, he said. Bokowski, in the most modern fashion, modest fashion, and without once mentioning himself, described the engagement, then told about his reception by the Minister of War. They received me and my news the way one welcomes a dog in a game of nine pins, he concluded. Billy Bin smiled ironically, and the lines of his face relaxed. Nevertheless, mon cher, he said, examining his fingernails from a distance and puckering the skin above his left eye, despite the high esteem in which I hold the Russian Orthodox army, I must say that your victory was somewhat less than victorious. He went on his way, he went on in this way, speaking French and saying in Russian only those words to which he wanted to give a scornful emphasis. Really, you with all your forces fall upon the unfortunate Morshore with his one division and he slips through your fingers, where's the victory? But seriously speaking, replied Prince Andre, we can certainly say without boasting that it was somewhat better than at Ohm. Why didn't you capture at least one marshal for us? Because not everything happens as one expects or with the orderliness of a parade. We had expected, as I told you, to attack their rear by seven o'clock in the morning. But we still hadn't got there by five in the afternoon. And why weren't you there at seven in the morning? You ought to have been there at seven, said Billy Bin with a smile. You ought to have been there at seven. Why didn't you impress on Bonaparte by diplomatic means that he had better leave Giona alone? asked Prince Andre in the same tone. I know, interrupted Billy Bin. You're thinking it's very easy to capture Marshall sitting on a sofa by the fire. That's true. But all the same, why didn't you take him? And don't be surprised if not only the Minister of War, but also his most august majesty, emperor, and king Franz, is not overjoyed by your victory. Even I, a miserable secretary of the Russian embassy, feel no particular delight. He looked straight at Prince Andre and suddenly unfurled his brow. Now, it's my turn to ask you why, my friend, said Balkowski. I confess I do not understand, and perhaps there are diplomatic subtleties here beyond my feeble intelligence. Mac loses a whole army, the Archduke Fernandez and the Archduke Karl gave no signs of life and make blunder after blunder. Kutuzov alone at last wins a victory breaks the spell of the French, and the Minister of War is not even interested in learning the details. And for that very reason, my dear fellow, don't you see, mon cher, it's horror for the Tsar, for Russia, for faith. That's all very fine, but what have we, I mean, the Austrian court, to do with your victories? Just bring us a nice bit of news about a victory of Archduke Karl or Fernandin, one Archduke as good as another, as you know, even if it's only a victory over one of Bonaparte's fire brigades, and that will be another matter. Then you hear our cannons boom, but this sort of thing seems to have been done expressively to provoke us. Archduke Karl does nothing. Archduke Fernand covers himself with disgrace. You abandon Vienna, give up its defense, as if to say, God help us, but God help you and your capital. The one general we all love, Schmidt, you put in the way of a bullet, and then you congratulate us on a victory. You must admit that anything more exasperating than the news you have brought would be hard to imagine. It's as if done on purpose. Besides, suppose you did win a brilliant victory, or even if Archduke Karl 
were to win a victory. How would that alter the general course of events? It's too late now, when Vienna is occupied by French troops. What? Occupied? Vienna occupied? Not only is it occupied, but Bonaparte is at Schumbrunn, and the Count, or dear Count Verbena, goes to him for orders. After the fatigues and the impressions of the journey, his reception and especially after dined, Bukowski felt unable to grasp the full significance of what he was hearing. Count Lechenfels was here this morning, Billy Bin continued, and showed me a letter in which the French parade in Vienna was described in detail. Prince Morat el le Tremblat. So you see, your victory is not a matter for very great rejoicing, and you can hardly be received as a savior. Really? I don't care about that. Don't care at all, said Prince Andre, beginning to understand that his news of the battle at Krems was in fact a little importance in view of such events as the occupation of Austria's capital. How was Vienna taken? What of the bridge and the famous bridgehead and Prince Augsburg? We heard rumors that Prince Augsburg was defending Vienna, he said. Prince Augsburg is stationed on this side, on our side of the river, and is defending us, doing it very badly. I think, nevertheless, defending us. But Vienna is on the other side. No, the bridge has not yet been taken, and I hope it won't be, because it is minded and orders have been given to blow it up. Otherwise, we should long ago have been in the hills of Bohemia, and you and your army would have had a bad time of it between two fires. But this still doesn't mean the campaign's over, said Prince Andre. Well, I think it is, and so do all the numbskulls here, but they don't dare to say so. It will be, as I said in the beginning of the campaign, the matter will not be settled by your skirmishes at Duristein. As a rule, things are settled not by gunpowder, but by those who invented it, said Billy Ben, quoting one of his own epigrams, and his brow smoothed as he paused momentarily. It's simply a question of what comes of the Berlin meeting between Emperor Alexander and the Prussian king. If Prussia joins the alliance, that will force Austrians' hand, and there will be a war. If not, it is only a matter of coming to an agreement about where the articles of a new Campo Formio are to be drawn up. But what an extraordinary genius, Prince Andre suddenly exclaimed, striking the table with a small clenched fist. And what luck the man has. Bonaparte, Billen said quizzically, indicating by the furring of his brow that he was about to make a mot. Bonaparte, he repeated, and with particular stress on the U. I do believe that now that he is dictating laws to Austrian from Schönbrunn, we must relieve him of the U. I shall certainly adopt the innovation and call him simply Bonaparte. No, joking apart, said Prince Andre, do you really think the campaign is over? This is what I think. Austria has been made a fool of, and she is not used to it. She will retaliate. She's been made a fool of it in the first place because her provinces have been pillaged. They say the Holy Russian Army is looting outrageously. Her army is destroyed, her capital taken, and all for less bukes yucks of Sardinian majesty. And that is why, in Krasnos, ma chère, my institution tells me that we are being deceived, tells me that there is that there are no negotiations with France, and plans for peace, a secret peace, separately concluded. Impossible, said Prince Andre. That would be too base. Time will tell, said Billy Ben, his face again relaxing as a sign that the conversation was at an end. When Prince Andre reached the room that had been prepared for him, and lay down in clean linen, on the feathered bed, with its warm and fragrant pillows, he felt that the battle of which he had brought news was very remote from him. 
the Prussian alliance, Austria's treachery, Bonaparte's new triumph, tomorrow's Libby and parade, and his audience with Emperor Franz occupied his thoughts. He closed his eyes, but instantly the crackle of gunfire, the roar of cannons, and the rattling of carriage wheels sounded in his ears. Once more he saw the musketeers threading down the hillside. The French were firing, and he felt his heart palpitating as he rode forward beside Schmidt, with the bullets whistling merrily all around, and he experienced tenfold the joy of living as he had not done since he was a child. He woke up. Yes, that all happened, he said, smiling happily to himself like a child. And he fell into a deep, youthful slumber. Chapter 11 The next day, he woke up late. Reviewing his recent impressions, the first thought that came to his mind was that today he was to be presented to the Emperor Franz. He recalled the Minister of War, the polite Austrian's aide de camp, Bilibin, and last night's conversation. Having dressed for his attendance at court in full dress uniform, which he had not worn for a long time, he entered Bilibin's study, fresh, animated, and handsome, with his hand bandage. In the study, he found four gentlemen of the diplomatic corps. He was already acquainted with Prince Apollet Kurigan, who was a secretary at the ambassador, 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 and Billy Bin introduced him to the others. The gentlemen calling on Billy Bin were rich, gay young men who here, as in Vienna, formed a special set with Billy Bin. Their leader, called Les Notres, are people. It was a small circle consisting almost exclusively of diplomats with interests of its own that evidently had nothing to do with the war politics, interests relating to high society, to certain women, and the official side of the service. These gentlemen readily accepted Prince Andre as one of themselves, an honor they vouchsafed to very few. Out of politeness and to start the conversation, they asked him a few questions about the army and the recent engagement, and then reverted to in consequential gossip and merry jest. And what was especially delightful, said one, telling of the misfortune of a fellow diplomat, was that the Chancellor told him straight out that his appointment to London was a promotion, and that he was to regard it as such. Can't you just see the figure he cut? But the worst of it, gentlemen, now I'm going to give Currigan away, is that this Don Juan here, this dreadful fellow, is going to profit by the man's misfortune. Prince Apollet was lolling in a volunteer chair with his legs over his arm. He laughed. Come now, come now. Oh, you Don Juan, you serpent, he they cried. You probably don't know, Bogowski, Billy Bin turned to Prince Andre, that all the atrocities of the French army, I was on the verge of saying the Russian army, are nothing compared to the havoc this man wreaks among the ladies. La femme est la capang la homme, announced Prince Apollet and peered through his largeness at his elevated legs. Bilibin and Les Notris roared with laughter, looking Apollet straight in the face. Prince Andre saw that this Apollet, of whom he had to admit, had been almost had almost been jealous on his wife's account, was the laughing stock of his set. But I must give you a real treat, said Bilibin in a low voice to Balkowski. Kurigan is a delight when he has to, when he discusses politics. You should see his gravity. He sat down beside Apollet, and wrinkling his brow, commenced talking to him about politics. Prince Andre and the others gathered around them. The Berlin cabinet is incapable of expressing its opinion of the alliance, began Apollet, looking at them significantly, without expressing, as in its last note. You understand, you understand, and besides, if His Majesty the Emperor does not deviate from the principle of our alliance, wait. I have not finished, he said to Prince Andre, seizing him by the arm. I suppose that intervention will be stronger than non-intervention. And, he paused, finally, one cannot impute the non-receipt of our dispatch 
of November 18th. That's how it will all end. And he released Balkonsky's arm as a sign that he had now quite finished. Demothenes, I know thee by the pebble those secrets in thy golden mouth, said Bilibin, his satisfaction revealing itself in the way his shock of hair moved on his scalp. Everyone laughed, a pilot loudest of all. He became visibly distressed, could not catch his breath, yet was unable to restrain the wild laughter that convulsed his usually impassive features. Now then, gentlemen, said Billy Ben, Balowski is my guest here in Brunn, and I want to entertain him to the degree that I can with all the pleasures of life here. If we were in Vienna, it would be easy but here in this wretched Morvirian hole it is more difficult, and I beg you all to help me. We must do the honors of Brunn for him. You take upon yourselves the theater, I, society, and a pilot, of course, women. We must show him a Millie. She's enticing, said one of Lester Notras, kissing his fingertips. Altogether, we must divert this bloodthirsty soldier to more human interests, said Billy Bin. I doubt that I shall be able to avail myself of your hospitality, gentlemen. It is already time for me to go, said Balowski, glancing at his watch. Where to? To the Emperor! Oh, 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 oh. Well, au revoir, Balkowski. Au revoir, Prince. Come back earlier to dinner. We'll look after you. When speaking to the Emperor, try as much as you possibly can to praise the way provisions have been supplied and routes indicated, said Billy Ben. Accompany Balkowski to the hall. I should like to praise them, but from what I know, I cannot, replied Balkowski, smiling. Well, talk as much as you can anyway. He has a passion for giving audiences, but doesn't like talking himself, and can't, as you will see. Chapter 12 At the Libby the Emperor Franz merely looked intently at Prince Andre, who was standing in his designated place among the Austrian officers, and nodded his long head. But after the levy, the same aide de camp he had seen the previous day ceremoniously conveyed to Balkowski the Emperor's desire to give him an audience. The Emperor Franz received him standing in the middle of the room. Before the conversation began, Prince Andre was struck by the fact that the Emperor seemed confused and blushed, as if not knowing what to say. Tell me, when did the battle begin? he asked hurriedly. Prince Andre answered him. The question was followed by others equally simple. Was Kutuzov well? How long was it since he had left Krems? And so on. The Emperor spoke as if his sole aim were to put a certain number of questions. The answer to these questions, as was only too evident, had absolutely no interest for him. At what hour did the battle begin? asked the Emperor. I cannot inform your majesty at what the hour the battle began at the front, but at Durenstein, where I was, the troops started attacking about six o'clock in the evening, said Balski, growing more animated and expecting that now he would have the opportunity to give an accurate description, which he had already prepared in his mind of all he had knew and had seen. But the Emperor smiled and interrupted him. How many miles? From where to where, Your Majesty? From Durenstein to Krems. Three and a half miles, Your Majesty. The French have abandoned the left bank? According to our scouts, the last of them crossed on rafts during the night. Is there sufficient fodder at Krems? Fodder has not been supplied to the extent the, interrupt the Emperor interrupted him. At what hour was General Schmidt killed? At seven o'clock, I believe. At seven o'clock? Very sad, very sad. The Emperor expressed his thanks and bowed. Prince Andre withdrew and was instantly surrounded by courtiers. On all sides he encountered friendly looks and friendly words. The same aide, the same aide de camp reproached him for not having stayed at the palace and offered him his own house. The Minister of War came up and congratulated him on the order of Maria Theresa, third grade, which the Emperor was conferring on him, 
The Empress's Chamberlain informed him that Her Majesty also wished to see him. He did not know whom to answer, and it took him a few seconds to collect his thoughts. Then the Russian ambassador took him by the shoulder and led him away to a window, where he began to talk to him. Contrary to what Billy Bin had said, the news he had brought was received with rejoicing. A Thanksgiving service was ordered. Kutuzov was awarded and Grand Cross of Maria Theresa, and the entire army was rewarded. Bolkowski was invited everywhere and had to spend almost the whole day calling on the principal Austrian dignitaries. At about five o'clock, having made all his calls, he was on his way back to Billy Bent's house and mentally composing a letter to his father about the battle and his trip to Braun. Before returning, however, he had stopped at a bookshop to lay in the stock of books for the campaign and had spent some time there. At the door of Bilibin's house stood a briska half full of luggage and friends. Bilibin's servant was having difficulty dragging a trunk through the front door. What's happened? asked Botsky. Oh, your excellency, said Franz, struggling to hoist the trunk onto the briska. We are moving on still farther. The villain is again at our heels. What is it? What are you saying? asked Prince Andre. Bilibin came out to meet him. His face, ordinary calm, showed his excitement. Now, you must admit that this is charming, he said. This affair of the Tabor Bridge in Vienna. They have crossed without striking a blow. Prince Andre did not understand. But where have you been that you do not know what every coachman in town knows? I was calling on the Archduchess. I heard nothing there. And you didn't see that people everywhere are packing up? No, I didn't. But what is going on? asked Prince Andre impatiently. What is going on? What is going on is that the French have crossed the bridge that Osseberg was defending, and the bridge was not blown up. So Marat is coming full speed along the road to Brome and will be here in a day or two. What? Here? But why didn't they blow up the bridge if it was mine? That's what I'm asking you. No one, not even Bonaparte, knows why. Bosky shrugged his shoulders. That's not the point, replied Billy Bin. Listen, the French enter Vienna as I told you. Splendid. Next day, that is, yesterday, these gentlemen, the Marshals Marat, Lannis, and Billiard, all three Gascons, you will note, mount their horses and ride off to the bridge. Gentlemen, says one of them, you know that the Tabar is mined and countermined, that there is a formidable bridgehead, and 15,000 troops with orders to blow up the bridge prevent us from crossing. But it would please our sovereign emperor, Napoleon, if we were to take the bridge. So let us, us three go and take it. Yes, let's say the others. And off they go and take the bridge, cross it. And now with the whole army on the side of the Dunaba, they are making for us and for you and your lines of communication. Stop jesting, said Prince Andre gravely. The news distressed him and at the same time gave him pleasure. The moment he learned that the Russian army was in such a hopeless position, the thought suggested itself to him that he was the man who was destined to lead it out of this, out of this situation, that it had come, the Toulon that was to raise him from the ranks of obscure officer and set him on the path to glory. Listening to Bilibin, he was already imagining how on reaching the army he would give his opinion in the war council, and only one that could save the army, and how he alone would in be entrusted with the execution of the plan. Stop jesting, he said. I am not jesting, Bilibin continued. Nothing could be more truer or sadder. These gentlemen ride onto the bridge alone and wave white handkerchiefs. They persuade the officer on duty that it's a truce, that they, the marshals, are on their way to negotiate with Prince Osper. He lets them enter the bridgehead. They spin him a thousand gasconades telling them that the war is over, that the Emperor Franz has arranged a meeting with Bonaparte, that they want to see Prince Osberg, and so on. The officer sends for Osberg. These gentlemen embrace the officers, make jokes, sit down on a cannon, and meanwhile a French battalion advances on the bridge unobserved, throws the sack of combustion material into the water, and approaches the bridgehead. Finally, the Lieutenant General, our dear Prince Osberg von Martin himself, appears. Dearest foe, flower of Austrian soldiery, hero of the Turkish wars, 
Hostilities are over. We can shake hands. The Emperor Napoleon burned with impatience to make Prince Osberg's acquaintance. In a word, these gentlemen, who are not Gascons for nothing, overwhelm him with fine phrases, and he is so flattered by this sudden intimacy with the French marshals, so dazzled by the spectacle of Morat's cloth and ostrich plums, that the fire he ought to have turned on them flamed only in his eyes. Despite the ardor of his speech, Bilibin did not forget to pause to give time for his mot to be appreciated. The French battalion rushes to the bridgehead, spikes the cannons, and the bridge is taken. But what is best of all, he continued, his agitation yielding to the charm of his story, is that the sergeant assigned to the cannon that was to give the signal for firing the mines and blowing up the bridge. This sergeant, seeing French troops running onto the bridge, was about to fire, but Lannis stayed his hand. The sergeant, clearly wiser than his general, goes up to Osberger and says, Prince, you've been tricked. The French are here. Moret sees that the game is up if the sergeant is allowed to speak, and with feigned astonishment, a true Gascon turns to Osberg and says, Where is your world-famous Austrian discipline, that, you're, that you permit a subordinate to address you in this manner? A stroke of genius, Prince Osberg's honor is at stake, and he has the sergeant put under arrest. Come, you must admit that this whole story of the Tauber Bridge is delightful. It's not just your stupidity, nor is it cowardice. It may be treachery, said Prince Andre, vividly imagining the great great coats. The wounds, the smoke of gunfire, cannoning, and the glory that awaited him. Not that either. This puts the court in a nice position, Billy Ben went on. It's neither treachery nor cowardice nor rascality. It's just as it was at home. He seemed to be searching for the right expression. It's just as it was with Mac. We've been Mac, he concluded. Feeling that he had made a mot, a first one that would be repeated. His furrowed brow became smooth again as a sign of his satisfaction, and smiling slightly, he began to scrutinize his fingernails. Where are you off to? he said to Prince Andre, who had risen and was going toward his room. I must go. Where to? To the army. But you intended to stay another two days. Now I must leave at once. And after giving directions about his departure, Prince Andre went to his room. You know, my friend, said Billy Ben, following him, I have been thinking about you. Why are you going? And as evidence of the irrefutability of the argument he was about to advance, all the wrinkles vanished from his face. Prince Andre looked inquiringly at him and made no reply. Why are you going? I know you think it's your duty to gallop off to the army when it is in danger. I understand this, mon cher. It is heroism. Not at all, said Prince André. But you are a philosopher, so be one, fully. Look at the other side of the question, and you will see that, on the contrary, your duty is to take care of yourself. Leave all that to others who are not fit for anything else. You have not been ordered to return, and you have not been dismissed from there, from here. Therefore, you can remain and go with us. They say we are going to Utmost, and Utmost is a very charming town. You can travel there quite comfortably in my carriage. Do stop joking, Billy Ben, said Bosky. I'm speaking to you sincerely, as a friend. Consider where and why are you going, when you might remain here. You are faced with one of two things. The skin over his left temple puckered as he spoke. Either you will not reach the army before peace is concluded, or you will share the defeat and disgrace of Kutuso's whole army. And feeling that the dilemma was insoluble, Bilbin let the wrinkles relax. I cannot discuss it, said Prince Andre Coley, but he thought, I'm going in order to save the army. Monsieur, you are a hero, said Billy Bin. And with that, I'm going to leave it off there. Thank you for watching. Please continue to watch. If you like it, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Leave a comment below. You can subscribe to the channel. And uh, oh, you don't have to do anything. Just keep watching the videos. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.